get our song books this morning, please. Let's turn to 324 and let's stand and sing together with the choir. Draw me nearer. Number 324. missionary brother Doug Cook come and pray for us this morning <laughs> brother Cook you come and pray for us and let's be an attitude of prayer please Father we love we thank you for the privilege and opportunity that we do have to come together as a church family to worship and to praise you Father we ask your blessing on our service this morning the, the music the special music Lord the congregational singing Lord and Lord help us prepare our hearts and our minds for the preaching of thy word and Father is anyone here tonight without this morning without Christ it's today would be the day of salvation yes. Father we thank you Lord for the victory that we do have in Christ we thank you for the victory and the, and the privilege that we have through serving you and seeing others yes. saved through the ministry of the Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. What a privilege it is to see the outreach and the many, many aspects of many different ministries, Lord, we're seeing souls saved. And Father, we ask for your continued blessing. Lord, help us to be faithful. As we serve you faithfully, we'll see more souls. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can be seated. The choir's going to be seated, too, if you would, please. Just for a second, we're going to change things around a little bit this morning. Brother Carney's uh, the group has got to return from North Dakota from our mission trip. And he has to go back downstairs and working in junior church this morning. And I want him to come just share a brief word of testimony about what happened on our mission trip. Brother Carney? First of all, I want to thank everybody that went on our trip. We couldn't have done it without uh, each and every one of you. We had 40 that went with us. Crystal, do we have 64 saved? Was that total? We had 64 saved Amen. this week. Amen. And that was worth it. And uh, the Indians up there that we had, were there working with, the Sioux Indian, were very, very, were very hard. Uh, the kids have no idea what love is, what real love is. Uh, they practically raise themselves. And just to tell you some few things, if you don't feed them, they don't send them back sometimes because they open the school up. The government gives them everything there that they can, could possibly ever want. And, and they're hard. They, they are just uh, wild. Uh, they, they do what they want to do. And Brother Jimmy really has his work cut out for him. And I know his prayer is that he needs some people up there. He's got a, he's got a couple now with him from West Virginia, Jeff and uh, I think uh, Jennifer Moore, I think that's their name, to help him. But yet he needs some, what he needs, I believe, is some people, Native American Indians, to get saved. I mean, get sold out for God to help him. And he's got a building that he's got pay, almost paid for. Uh, it's a, it's, I think it's 30 by 150 that he's going to be able to put up here before long. He hopes to. And uh, we had several people, uh, you know, had a lot, a lot of kids saved, and that was good. It was hard work. 
it was uh, laborers, uh, but uh, appreciate everybody that, that went. Amen. And I have one thing I want to say, uh, one more thing here. We had a lady that really, really had a hard time up there. She had to really fight in the trenches and work hard and do things. And she got in her hotel room one night and she grabbed a shoe and she saw this bug over in the corner just beating it, you know, had a tennis shoe. And then she thought she wasn't hitting it good enough, so she uh, got the, uh, a, a regular dress shoe and come found out. And then she went and got a great big long piece of toilet paper to try to get that thing up and put, throw it away, you know how women do. And come found out it was, it was a balloon. And uh, <laughs> We want to say uh, to, to Thelma Duncan that she is really a warrior, you know, and we appreciate that we had somebody like that to stand by us to help us up there. Thank you, preacher. <laughs> Tonight, during the service, some more folks will be giving their testimony of what took place. All right, Brother Harvey. <laughs> sing together 147 leaning on the everlasting arm everyone stand and join the choir
say thank you for coming to Mount Pisgah Baptist Church this morning. I appreciate so much your presence here. If you're visiting today with us for the first time or first time in a long time, I'd like for you to give you a visitor's card that you fill it out, keep the ink pen, put in the offering plate after you fill it out, and uh, it'll be, the offering plate will be passed in just a few minutes. But our ushers are standing here at the front. If you're visiting today for the first time or first time in a long time, I'd like a visitor's card. If you'll raise your hand up just for a moment, we'll get it in your hand. You can fill it out for us. If you're visiting today for the first time or first time in a long time, some folks toward the back, Tom and Ronnie, I saw had their hand up on the right-hand side over here, my right-hand side, if you do that for us. Thank you so much. All right, and then on another family right back there. Thank you folks for doing that for us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for visiting with us at Mount Pisgah this morning. Ushers are going to come. Brian Lawson, you can pray for us this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you again for allowing us to come together in your name. I ask now that uh, you'll be with uh, the preacher, Lord, as he gives the message, that uh, you'll open our hearts and our minds, that we'll take the message that uh, you've given him and that we'll apply it to our lives and that other people will see you through our lives. I ask now, Lord, that if there be any unsaved in the services today, Lord, that God, that You'll just touch them in a special way and let the Holy Spirit have free reign and let them come to know you as their Savior. I ask now that you'll bless this offering and the money that is brought forth and given to you, Lord, that you'll just multiply it and let your works show forth, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to try to kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> So that I'm playing, someone's asked me to sing. I can sing while taking up the offering. Try to. I want to get your money first, though. <clears throat> place 
He did it all for me. drop of blood he shed for even me when the Savior cried bowed his head and died oh praise the Lord he did it all for me when I step just inside of those gates of pearl and the Savior's face I see I'll gladly kiss those nail-scarred feet Oh, praise the Lord He did it all for me drop of blood he shed for even me when the Savior cried bowed his head and died oh praise the Lord he did it all for me Joshua chapter 1 please Brother Craig. <coughs> that was a blessing, amen. Be okay. I had a couple of songs I'd like to sing. The first one tells a story of, uh, of our family and our relatives up in heaven could talk to us audibly from uh, from heaven to earth. They may say something like this: well, I can just see them walking on the shores of heaven. Praising the Lord and watching the tide roll in. Friends and family, oh, how I miss you so. And I know if you could talk to me now, that you'd let me know that you're doing fine. It doesn't hurt anymore Things couldn't be better Heaven is worth waiting for and You miss me too and Until then you'll be praying for me And I know if you could talk to me now Here's what you'd say to me I wish you were here It's such a beautiful place I wish you were here Nothing but clear sunny days Oh, it never rains and no one complains We haven't seen Having a great time Wish you were here well, I can just see them Walking on the shore 
talking with Jesus, safe and secure in his love. Friends and loved ones walking in heavenly peace. And I know if you could talk to me now, here's what you'd say to me. Wish you were here, it's such a beautiful place. Wish you were here, nothing but clear sunny days. Oh, it never rains and no one complains. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. Joshua chapter 1. Thank you, Craig. Is it wonderful, all those souls that were saved? I want to thank the Lord for answering prayer, for giving safety to our folks as they traveled, and all the vehicles ran good. Didn't have any problems out of them. That's a blessing over that long of trip, and only two people got in a fight with each other. That wasn't bad. And, uh, only lost three or four members. That wasn't bad. Also, I want to thank the Lord for the rain he gave us. I asked the Lord for some rain. And I'm sure you did too, and I'm thankful for that as well. You can remain seated because I'm going to read several passages of Scripture. You need to get a pencil piece of paper this morning if you'll need to take some notes, and you'll need to remember what I'm going to say this morning. But after I read the Scripture we're going to read, we'll stand and have a prayer together, and you can be seated. Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people of the land which I will give to thee, even to the children of Israel. Every place of the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Chapter 3, verse 17. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all of the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Chapter 6, verse 16. It came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord thy God giveth, or the Lord hath given you the city. If that gentleman needs to find where the nursery is, some of you ushers can help him, please. Instead of just maybe going out, he doesn't have to do that. Chapter 7, verse 5. And the men of Ai, hey, excuse me, and the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Sherub, and smote them in the going down. Smote them in the going down, it says, Wherefore the hearts of the people, this time about Israel, melted and became as water. One more, chapter 8, verse 21. <clears throat> and when Joshua and all of Israel saw the ambush had taken the city, and that the smoke of the city ascended, they returned again and slew the men of Ai. Would you stand with me? We'll have a brief word of prayer, and then you can be seated. God, you made us, you called us, you helped us, so help us this hour. Speak to every heart. Let it be a message of understanding. Let none misunderstand. May you speak to our hearts in such a way we'd honor Christ. We love you. Thank you for your folks. Thank you for the good things you've done for us and continue to do and are going to do. And I tell you, I love you now. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. I pray that the Lord will help Dan Runyon today. He's having surgery right now, and if you'll remember him, I know the family would appreciate it. In our text tonight, we're introduced to a man in the name of Joshua. For years, he's been in the shadow of a man named Moses. One of the meekest men upon earth was Moses. And Joshua served underneath him. He was not in the forefront. You hardly read much about him. There are some things we know about him, of course. We know he was one of the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who said, uh, let's go up and take the land. When ten other spies, let's don't take the land. We know that about him. We know that for 40 years he had to wonder, not because of his own sin or not because of his own unfaithfulness, but because of others' failure to want to take the land. We know that, but he never complained one time. But now, he has been faithful over a few things. He'll be made ruler over many things. And just as God had been with Moses to direct him, to lead him, to help him, God has promised to Joshua that everywhere the sole of your foot trods, Moses is dead now, you're the new leader, everywhere the sole of your foot trods, I'm going to give it to you. God gives him a promise of blessing, a promise of protection, a promise to defeat his enemies, a promise to lead them into possessions of land. Now, the promise was given to Joshua, listen to me now, before they fought their first battle. We see that the 
book of Joshua is a chapter of battle after battle, of conquering after conquering. But God gave him the promise of victory for the first shot was ever fired. For they went to the first battle, God promised them victory. Now Joshua was no stranger to warfare. He knew what it was to fight. If you'll look back in Exodus 17, you'll make a note of that, that Joshua is in the valley fighting the Amalekites one day. And Moses is sitting on a rock and he's holding his arms up and he's praying for him and asking God to help him as he fights the battle. And about this is a very unusual story. It says as long as Moses' arms are reached toward heavens that Joshua's defeating the enemy. He's defeating them uh, just left and right. But Moses would get weary just like your arms would do if you hold them up for a while and they'd begin to go down. And when his arms would go down, Joshua would lose the battle. So Aaron and Hur, one on one side of Moses, one on the other side got underneath him and they raised Moses' arms up and they held his arms up and God gave him the victory. It's just like you praying for the preacher while he's preaching or praying for somebody while they're going through a time of battle in their life. You're holding them up. You're trying to give them strength as well. And we know that he fought that battle that direction and he was able to win the battle there. But God gave him the promise. He was to possess the land and the people of God with him. There's something else here I want to show you, though, before I get into what I want to speak with you about this morning, just setting a background. In chapter 3, I read a verse of Scripture where the priest stood firm in the midst of Jordan. And what happened, the priest and before the children of Israel passed over into the promised land, all of them were going to go fight. They wouldn't leave half of the tribe or two and a half tribes back. All of them had to go fight. And they came to Jordan's river, which was at its swelling tide, and the priests first put their feet in the water and the water divided and the children of Israel walked over on dry ground. It was God doing for that generation what God done for a previous generation at the Red Sea, showing them that God is still God. Let me tell you something, folks. We don't serve a God that I was. We serve a God that's I am. Amen? Amen. And every victory that these people got, every victory they won over in Canaan, they won on resurrection ground. And if I win any battles in my life, and if you win any battles in your life, you're going to win them on resurrection ground. Romans 8, 11, that the same Spirit of God lives in us that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. He lives in you and in me. They came to Canaan. Now, we have a misunderstanding about Canaan. We think that Canaan is, a, is heaven, and that's not true. Now, we sing about in our songs, and I'm not making, I'm not making light of our songs we sing, but Canaan is not heaven. You can't have that in the Bible because Canaan, they had battles. They fought the whole time they was in Canaan. They battled and they battled, but they won. And a Canaan is a type of inheriting God's possession by taking God at his word and believing God that no matter the fight you're in, no matter what battles you're facing, God's promised to give you victory because you're living in the power of a resurrected Savior. That's for us. Now, the first battle that Israel fought is called the Battle of Jericho. Say it with me, the Battle of what? Jericho. How many of you know the story of the Battle of Jericho? How many of you know the story? All right. I always think of this little story when I think of the Battle of Jericho. I think about the Sunday school teacher one morning who said to one of her students, said, Johnny, said, Did you, do you know who tore down the walls of Jericho? And Johnny said, oh, preach, said, teacher, I didn't do it. And she said, now, wait a minute, Johnny. That's what I mean. He said, I've taught you for weeks about the Battle of Jericho. He said, teacher, I didn't do it. Well, the Sunday school teacher was so disgusted that she had taught this boy for weeks about the Battle of Jericho. She was totally frustrated. He hadn't learned anything. She said, I'll tell you what, let's just go. So we're going to go talk. We're going to go right now, and we're going to talk to one of the deacons. Well, she got up, little John, took him to the deacons and said, I was teaching this boy about the walls of Jericho. Said, I asked him, did he tear the walls of Jericho down? And you know what he said? He said, he didn't do it. And the preacher said, listen, I know that boy. If he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. <laughs> She's really frustrated now. And she takes him to the Buildings and Grounds Committee. And she said, listen, I've talked to this boy. He said, he didn't tear down the walls of Jericho. Said, the deacon said he didn't tear it down. Said, well, I've come here. I've discussed it. He said, the, well, the building committee said, we'll build it back. Don't worry about it, all right? They didn't know either, all right? <laughs> That's sad, amen? But they fought the Battle of Jericho. Walked around it one time for six days, seventh day. They walked around it seven times, and the walls fell down. Rahab was delivered. You know the story. But now they're facing another battle of a small town called Ai. Say it with me. It's called what? Ai. Ai. And they're going to go up, and they're going to fight the battle of Ai, and they're going to lose, and 36 men of Israel are going to die. And they lose at a small place. They lose their battles. I want to tell you about those two battles, and I want to share something with you this morning. Number one, that every battle you fight in your life must be fought at God's directions. 
Every battle you fight in your life must be fought at God's direction. You remember the direction God gave the children of Israel at Jericho? He said, you walk around that city on the first day. He said, you walk around it one time. He said, you just walk around. Don't shout. Don't play any music. One time, you walk around it. Now, can you imagine that fighting men he had who wanted to take that city, who had the promise of God the city was theirs, can you imagine how those people inside must have thought, that's a strange group of fighters I've ever seen in my life, just walking in circles. He said, all right. He said, that's what you do. Second day, he said, you walk around. Third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, so you walk around. Seventh day, they was getting ready to finish their seventh lap. They came, they made the last step of the seventh lap. He said, sound the music, sound the trumpets. And they sounded, and the walls of Jericho fell down. I believe that story as much as I believe that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. I believe that's a literal miracle that happened in the Bible. And the city was totally destroyed at the direction of God. God pulled it down. And you have some walls in your life that you may think you can conquer by your own means and your own reasoning and your own plan, but I want to tell you that our weapons which we fight are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds in our lives. We fight God's battles at God's direction in our life if we're ever going to win the battles of life. We lean not to our own understanding. All our ways acknowledge him. He to direct our paths. You'd think if someone retaliated and once someone fought against you, you'd think the best thing for you to do is what? Fight back. That's not what God says. He don't fight that battle that way. There's so many things in life you think that you'd do them that way, but God says, no, that's not the way you do them. And if you've won any victories in the past in your life, you've won them at the direction of God or you've not won them at all. Amen? Second thing. I want you to listen close to this statement. These next 15 minutes are the heart of the sermon, and I'll give you two or three points quickly after that. Secondly, I want to say this. Past victories, now listen to me. Past victories do not ensure present victories unless you walk with God. Did you hear what I said? I said that past victories in your life does not ensure you of present victories in your life unless you walk with God. Look in chapter 7, the book of Joshua, and you're going to find out that in chapter 6 is where the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. In chapter 7, they're going to go up and they're going to fight Ai. Is that correct? And here's what they said in verse number 3. They sent some spies up to look at Ai in verse number 3. And they returned to Joshua and they said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. You know what they said? They didn't ask God what to do. They did something that got them in trouble in the past. They sent some uh, uh, committee out <laughs> without asking God what to do. And they looked at it and they said, oh, so we can take it. We won. We defeated Jericho. Ai is a small place that we can take it. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you two reasons why they lost the battle of Ai. Number one, they lost it because they were self-sufficient. Here's what they said. They said, we, can, we, can, we won this battle in the past. We have, a, we have a great army. There's no use for us to worry about it. They're fall. They're small. We're self-sufficient. The greatest danger any church or individual ever comes in your life is when you think you're full and rich and have need of nothing. You're in bad shape in your life as a Christian. Did you hear me? Oh, we're starting a new building program. We have a new home. The church is doing fine. If I don't bring people to church, somebody else will. We support 143 missionaries. We print 2,300 scriptures a day. We have need of nothing. We don't need to pray. We don't need to sacrifice. We don't need to witness. We don't need to work. We don't need to be faithful on Sunday nights. We don't need to read the Bible. We've just got all we need. And I want to tell you, when we come to that place in our lives... Brother, we're in the greatest danger we've ever been in our lives. Second Chronicles 25, Second Chronicles 26, 15 is a verse that you ought to underline your Bible. I do. It talks about King Uzziah, U-S-S-I-A-H. The Bible says that he was marvelously helped. God helped him marvelously. Second Chronicles 26, verse 15. That God helped him marvelously, listen now, until he was strong. Huh. God said, hey, God did great things for Uzziah. God did great things for him, but he became strong in his own thinking and strong in his own might, and God let him fall. 
You know why that the battle was lost at Ai? The same reason you lose battles in your life. It's because of the fact that they were self-sufficient. I don't need God anymore. My work, God gave me a good job. I don't need him anymore. I don't need God in my marriage. Man, we've got along for two days. <laughs> Put that down. Let me hear about it. <laughs> they lost the battle because of self-sufficient. Second thing they lost the battle. Second thing called because of unconfessed sin. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, it tells all who he's kin to, who was a tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. One man caused the anger of God to be kindled against the whole race of Israel. And simply the reason is this, that you never sin in isolation. What you do always affects somebody. Unconfessed sin. Even over a small thing that seemingly, something we'd think would be a small enemy, sin had, had defeated the children of Israel. The two sins of Achan are this. I want you to listen to me now. He stole a wedge of gold, some shekels of silver, and some Babylonian garments. Listen to me now. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. He had dirty money and dirty dress. Two things. It was dirty money because the money he had stole had been dedicated, dedicated to the false gods. And that money belonged to God. It was an accursed thing and he wasn't taking it. Listen to me. Money is neither bad nor good. It's neither one. It's neutral. Money is what you make it. Is that not true? Can you make your money do good things? Answer me. Can you make it do evil things? So it's neutral. It's what you make of it. But first of all, he had dirty money. Secondly, he had dirty dress. What he did, the Babylonian garments were garments that the priests of Babylon's wore in worship of their false god. And it was just some clothes the children of Israel weren't to wear because they belonged to the Babylonians and did not belong to the children of God. There's something very alarming about this. Especially when you see the church moving toward the world instead of staying separate from the world. Now, Israel lost because Achan took of the accursed things. Now, there's some things that every child of God, you just don't need in your life. Now, there's more sins than you could ever mention. If I start mentioning sins this morning, I will a few of them, is there's, that somebody's going to say, well, I don't do those things, and therefore, boy, I'm a good person. I tell you, that's not the case. There's more than I could ever mention. Is that not true? Uh, suppose this morning. You know, people often say to me, said, now preacher said it doesn't matter what you are, as long as you're a Christian, you can be anything. That's not the truth, folks. We know that God looks at the heart, but where does man look? Now what appearance doesn't. So God knows what we are when man can't see what we are, but only man can see what we are as he looks at looks he looks at us, is that correct? Now, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say one word. I'm gonna do something and see if you can figure out what I'm doing. Now, what was I doing? No, I wasn't. I had a pen in my mouth. See, you got a bad idea. You shouldn't judge people, see? <laughs> That's exactly what it looked like, didn't it? <laughs> because your actions says something, do they not? Come on, right? I may go in a beer joint and never drink. As a matter of fact, I've been in a couple of beer joints since I've been here. I go in a beer joint, and I'll walk in. I'll get a lot of nerve before I go in. I'll sit about 10 minutes outside before I go in. I run in, the first thing I say is, I'm, I'm preacher walls. I've met some of my church members in there. <laughs> I, had a, I had a guy I tell you one time who's a bootlegger. I led him to Christ. And the preached his funeral, matter of fact. He said, preacher, he said, if we keep the Baptists away from uh, the, my house on Saturday night, said I could come to church on Sunday. I said, if you'll tell me what members of mine come to your house, I said, I'll tell you what, if they come, they'll be miserable. And I mean that. I've gone into beer joints, and I said, I'm preacher walls. First thing I do. And I start passing out tracts real quick. Tell them Jesus loves them, and I leave. I don't want to take up an offering or anything. Just leave. But see, I don't want to send the wrong message. I send the wrong message sometimes. I remember I was in Germany, and I, and I don't want to send the wrong message by my actions, what I'm saying. 
I was in Germany and I'd never been to a place and went behind, we went behind the wall before the wall came down actually preached on the street, corner, street corners of Germany and I'd never been into a, a restroom a rest bathroom where men and women were together in the same restrooms it's just weird well I walk in this one and here's this woman and I can't read German I can hardly read good English but I knew something I didn't think something was right I went back out and I looked on the door because on the door it has the men has pants on the women have dresses on like it ought to be man <laughs> I got one well, amen that wasn't bad so I went out and looked on it and I said well this is the right door and I walked back in and when I walked back in that woman said something to me and I couldn't understand what she was saying I couldn't understand what she was saying and so I did like this to that woman I went I was trying to say I didn't understand what she was saying and the missionary reached up and slapped my hands he said don't you say that I said say what he said this is a socialistic government and you just call that woman a crazy woman and they could put you in jail <laughs> I didn't do nothing I went like this. <laughs> but see, I was saying something about my actions. Amen? And I don't want to send the wrong message to anybody, do you? <clears throat> I don't want someone when they come to this church be reminded of their past life. I don't want the meat of the music, uh, the, the, yeah, the beat of the music to remind them where they came from. I don't want the dress that the women wear to remind where they came from. Or the attire the men put on. 1 Timothy 2.9 says this, let your women be dressed in modest apparel. I was at church one time. God being my witness, I saw this on my own eyes and I wouldn't believe if you hadn't told me. I saw one get up to sing, had a dress on, it was so short. This was years ago, I guess when they have different type of hoses, you could see the color of her hose change. That's how short it was. And she was singing, and she, here's what she did. Embarrassed the dickens out of me. And she got up, and she's going to sing, and she started singing. Here, she was singing. She said, I'm going up, up, up. That was, I'm going up, up, up to be with Jesus. And she got to bouncing. God being my witness. She didn't have enough clothes on to wad a shotgun. <laughs> that was disturbing. And I did preach. <laughs> and every person, I can save this message for a Sunday night, but I don't need to. Every person who's a leader in this church in the place of leadership needs to set the right example. Faithfulness? Well, it just can't be. Somebody else could. I'm talking about leadership now. Listen to me. Every Sunday school teacher, singing in the choir, working junior church program, nursery programs, bus program, deacons, wives, deacons, preacher and his wife, buildings and ground, daycare worker, Christian school, staff, print shop workers, those who sing in the choir, play instruments, those that are on the payroll, PA, TV, anything else I missed, your places of leadership. And every church ought to expect their leadership to set the right example. Now come on. And, I think, and let me tell you something one reason this nation is going to hell today is we have no people that want any leadership I want to tell you I want to tell, tell you how far we are to the end of time you listen to this statement I read the other day when small men cast long shadows the sun's about to set and that's where we are There's the things that are appropriate, they're not, and there's things appropriate, and things not appropriate. Now, I'm going to save us about a million dollars this morning because we're going to lose a lot of folks when I preach what I'm going to preach. 
but we don't have to build that building. Isn't that wonderful? I'm saving you a million dollars this morning. There's things appropriate and some not appropriate. There's certain things you could wear at your home that you shouldn't wear out. There's certain things you wear out you shouldn't wear to church. Modesty. Just think about it. Is it modest? Is it, do I look like I've been poured in it? Just asking. Am I showing my thigh? Just asking. Am I strapless? Just asking. I ain't getting a lot of help, but I'm asking. <laughs> what about the men? Well, let's talk about the men for a few minutes. I think there ought to be men. I think they ought to look like men. I think by street observation, you ought to say, that's a man. <laughs> Having to go over and say, speak to me. <laughs> right? Oh, well. How sweet. <laughs> you know where to kiss them or duck. And I'm not jealous because they have hair. I'm mad because I don't, but I'm not jealous because they do. But it ought to be short. If nothing else, you ought to have enough respect for this pastor that's told you that for all these years, that you at least do what he asks you to do if you're in a place of leadership. Here's what happened when I preached this like I did. I preached to leadership. A lot of people sitting here, they'll say, well, no, wait a minute. I can't, I'm not welcome there. I can't go there. No, you missed the whole point. I'm trying to get someone to live right before you. So you say, those people belong to God. And they're going to honor God with their lives. Now, here's what people say to me when I do this. To somebody, else. somebody else say this to me. They'll say, that's awful radical, Pastor. <laughs> you think that's radical? You ought to read what God did to Josh, to, Cape, to, to Achan. Read about it, Joshua chapter 7. Look there in your Bible, verse 24. You know what God did to, to Achan? God said, you get him and all of his family, all possession. You put him here and we're going to storm to death. That's radical. Hmm? And I want to tell you something. Let me tell you something. I believe this with all my heart. We have radical homosexuals. And you may not like the things I say about what, them, but I want to tell you, if God gives me breath and sense, I'll preach against it the day I die. We got radical homosexuals. We got radical feminists. And it's going to take some radical Christians to change this world where you and I live. That not ashamed of Jesus Christ. That the devil will tremble when you come around. Amen. Now, God delivered Israel from Egypt, delivered them across the Red Sea, delivered them through the wilderness, gave them great deliverance. And by the way, God gave us great deliverance. And the culprit that stole the victory from them was sin. And I want to tell you what stole the joy in your life and the victory in your life and the song in your life and the fellowship with God in your life and the peace in your life and the power in your life is because we don't keep short accounts for the Holy God. Self-sufficiency, complacency, and sin, they lost a small battle. Here's the next thing I want to tell you. Aren't you glad we're to the next thing? Joshua chapter 8, verse number 1. <clears throat> And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise, and go to Ai. I have given thy land, excuse me, thy hand, that I have given to thy hand the king of Ai, and his people, and his city, and his land. You know what? Here's what I want to say to you. Listen to me now. I want you to hear me. Don't you allow one defeat in your life to cost you future victories. They got set back one time. They got back up on their feet. They confessed their sin. They got right with God, and they went out and fought the victory. And God gave them the, God fought the battle, and God gave them the victory. Amen? Amen? Listen to me. Read this statement of the day. I told it Wednesday night to you. Matter of fact, you need to be here the next Wednesday nights. I'm teaching on the 70th week of Daniel, the next three Wednesday nights. Interesting, good, pertinent, powerful. You'll enjoy it. Wednesday nights. Okay, here. Yes, what happened? I made this statement. Listen to this. Sin had defeated them. They came back. They confessed. They won. Listen, listen. If you believe that you're too strong or you're too good to be overcome by sin or fault, you don't know the power of sin. Now, wait a minute. If you believe that sin's taking you too far and you can never come back, you don't know the power of God. 
to reclaim you. <laughs> you know what? Something I started telling the devil the other day. He was talking to me. He said to me, he said, now, preacher, he said, you know that, that you have this problem and you have that problem. You know what I finally said to the devil? I said, devil, everything I got wrong in me, I got it from you. He didn't seem to like that too much. But everything I got wrong in my life, I got it from you. Because every good gift, every perfect gift come down to the Father who's no shadow of turning, no variableness in Him. Let me give you the last thing, or the next to the last thing. Learn from your past failures. Learn from your past failures. Listen. Listen to this. This is good. When Joshua and the children of Israel went up to fight Ai, just the 3,000 went with him, they went up, and boy, they started fighting them, and they took off running. Well, when they ran, the men of Ai followed them to defeat them. So Joshua knew if he goes up this time and fights and they flee, they're going to come out again. Then he can defeat them. He learned from his past failures. No failure is a failure unless you, learn, unless you keep from learning something from it. Learn something from it. Here's the last thing. Is new victories, turn to chapter 8, require new commitment. I don't have time this morning. If I read verses 30 through 35, you'll see when they won that battle of Ai, that God said, I want a new commitment from you. I want a new commitment for you. You know, you think, oh, okay, I won this battle. I don't have to fight anymore. No, God says, I want a new commitment from you. And that's what they did. They gave God a new commitment in chapter 8, verses 30 through 35, that not a word uh, the, of the Lord, word of God, he did not read to them. And they, they said, Lord, we're going to do what you said to do. God, here we are. Help us overcome the past. Help us to, yes, Lord, not to be self-sufficient. Help us, Lord, of things in our life not pleasing to you. Dirty money, not using it proper. Dirty dress, uh, using the world's dress. God, help us. Help us to get the battle and win the battle for you. That's, that's it. Let me ask you a question. Is our church having to face different battles? Yes, we are. We're, we're, you know, I'm flooded all the time, honestly. And don't take me wrong with this. I'm flooded all the time. Folks says, we want to do this in your church. Not, not church members, other people call me sometimes. We want to do this. We want to do this for your church. We want to do this for your church. We want to do this. Listen, those things are things that we don't need to be involved in. There's some things I get offered to do. I keep myself from them. Because I don't need to be entangled with things that's going to take me away from being what I need to be for this church. And you don't either. Now listen, I'm through. The greatest battle ever fought was not the battle of Jericho, was not the battle of Ai. It was the battle the Son of God fought at Calvary when he died for the sins of the whole world. And by the fact, I want to say, it may look like defeat while he's hanging there. And it may look like defeat while he's dying there. It may look like defeat when he gives up the ghost. It may look like defeat when they lay him in the grave. But I want to tell you, came resurrection morning. There's no question about it. He's victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Greatest battle ever fought. And I'm glad I trust him as my Lord and Savior. I'm glad to tell you, you can too. While our heads are about our eyes are closed now. What a stupid question we'd asked you this morning. If you're facing any battles in your life, I know you are. And sometimes things that I preach on sometimes I think are not facing the real issue of the battles that you face where you are. Some of you are facing battles with sickness, disappointments, death of loved ones, surgeries and different things. So many things of life that seem, uh, that seem to just to weigh us down. But I want to tell you, even for those battles, we have a God that says, my grace is sufficient for you. I want to tell you, if we've been defeated in our lives, it could very easily be because of self-sufficiency. We've not depended upon God. Or we've got something in our life we know that's not pleasing to God. You can enjoy some victories if you learn, remember to walk with God. You can handle things on your own. Maybe the past is there to bother you. You've got a setback, but you can set back up. You've got a great... Listen, I'm glad to tell you this morning, thank God 10,000 times 10,000. You've got a God that's greater than your failures. And you can learn from Him. God needs a new commitment from you. How many quickly across this room would simply say, Pastor, I know I've trusted Jesus Christ to save me. I know that I'm saved. Would you raise your hand? Well, I, I know Christ lives in my heart. Isn't that wonderful to know Christ? All of God's people said? Yes. It certainly is. 
It certainly is. How many quickly raise hands and say, Pastor, I'm just facing some battles in my life. I'm really going through some hard times in my life about some things. And would you pray for me this morning? Would you put your hand where I can see? Up and right back down. God bless you. Several folks. I don't doubt that at all. And if all of us be honest, though our battles may not seem big to us at times, we have battles we face sometimes unaware of the traps the devil's laid for us. Therefore, we need God's help. You're facing some battles. Maybe you've lost some battles. Maybe there's some things in your life you've just, uh, uh, the devil set you back. And maybe this morning you realize, hey, the devil set me back. I've got off track of what a Christian ought to be. And I want to encourage you either publicly at this altar or, or in your seat privately to ask God to forgive you as I've had to ask him for me. And ask him to strengthen you for the battle and conflict. And ask our lives to be what God wants them to be. Of course, in this room, if you could not raise your hand, you know you're saved. I wish you let me have the opportunity to let you know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll come this morning, I'll be here at the front. I'll take the word of God and show you how you could be saved and how you can know it. Some folks couldn't raise your hand. You know you're saved. And God wants to help you. In your life, if you want God to help you, some area of your life, you're battling. You want God to help you. Why don't you just slip out of your seat this morning? Why don't you come and kneel somewhere and just ask God, say, God, I want you to help me with this battle I'm facing in my life. I want you to help me. Folks, I battle things for years. I want to tell you, I've got some victories over one or two of them last week. I've got others I'm going to battle. I'm going to battle them till I leave this world. But I'm gaining a few victories along the way. And I want you to gain a few victories in your life too. Would you do that? Spirit of God, I pray that none misunderstand. We'd all know that we need to be, what we, we need to be good examples of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In our faithfulness, the things we wear, the things we say, the places we go, the things we do. It is important. As you that name the, bear, bear the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. We have battles we face. We need your help with. I need help with them. Help us to do so and to admit so and to yield before you, I pray. In Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm simply asking you if the Spirit of God spoke to your heart about something you need to do. Praying for yourself or someone else or for any reason. I want you to slip out of your seat. I want you to come. You need to be saved. I want you to come. They're playing for us. You come on. Oh, wait just a moment. Softly and tenderly. You need to ask God about something in your heart and your life. You slip out of your seat. You can come. We'll stand together. We'll sing the first verse of that song. Let's stand. Let's sing. You come on while we stand, while we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home, why should we tarry when Jesus is
heads are bowed, our eyes are closed just for a moment. Took the blindfolds off, laid all the manure aside, not trying to hide anything from anybody. I hope the direction our church takes is the direction of holiness and a walk that please God. Don't you think that's the right direction? Maybe you're trying to make up your mind. I wonder if there'd be anybody here this morning. But you've been saved, but you've never made public what Christ has done for you. I want you to come. Others have already done that. We'll share that with you in a few minutes. If you've been, never been baptized, but you want to get baptized either this morning or another time to get baptized, I want you to come. Some of you here this morning have been praying about a church family. Maybe you'd like a church family that uh, makes a strong stand on Christians living right. God spoke to your heart about that this morning. I want you to feel free to come. You feel free to come. Let's sing one more verse, Brother Harvey. You need to come for any of those reasons. I want you to come. Be baptized. You're not with this church family. Make it public or set a time to get baptized. Let's oh, sing. You come. Oh, for the wonderful love He has promised. Promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, Come, you come on. just for a second with me please we have a young lady named Ashley she's going to get baptized this morning I had the privilege of leading her to the Lord over the phone one day I was making some phone calls and they've been coming to church for some time and she wanted to be saved just it was very difficult for her to be able to come come up here so you can see her better Becky uh, hope her for her to come forward one of the joy delights of my life has been able to lead individuals to Christ on a regular basis and I'm thankful for that but last week I had the privilege of leading Francis to the Lord in the hospital and she's out and uh, she's here this morning to let you know she's trusted Christ as her Lord and Savior I'm grateful for that I had the privilege of going to the home leading her husband to the Lord and he has a lot of sickness and is not able to get out a lot and you'll need to pray for Richard but I'm grateful that if you're great, great Francis made public she's gotten saved I want you to say amen. amen and also we're going to mention about praying for her later too she has some surgery coming up and you'll want to pray for her and Brother Harvey, if you'll take other requests, I'll get ready to baptize, then we'll baptize, and we'll be out of here shortly. I'm going to mention these names. Phyllis Arp, someone's asked us to pray for her this morning. Dan Runyon's probably in surgery now with some kidney stones. Nell Bailey had surgery at home. Charlotte Patterson's in a nursing home. Leland Bowman, that's David's father, is at the hospital in Oak Ridge. Francis King is here. You need to pray for her, please. Monty Russell is also, we need to pray for her. She's at the hospital there, our place near... Fort Sanders, Roland Copeland's having some tests run next week. Boy, this is why we those flowers too, son. Okay, do we have some other requests you'd like to add to the list this morning? Yes, Brother Christ. Okay, Faye Dunaway at Park West Hospital had surgery for cancer. Remember her in prayer? Is there any other? Yes, right here. Okay, a lady by the name of Kathy. Okay, Brother Cook. Okay, remember that request is church in Russia? Started their summer program, is it? Uh, in the camp program. And then he'll be speaking at Solway tonight. He wants our prayers for that service. Any other request? Yes. Okay, remember that one? Yes. Okay. 
Okay, Brother Nation and Sister Nation be uh, presenting their ministry before a uh, counseling board, to, before a mission board tomorrow night. Okay, remember that request. Okay, we want you to pray for Brother Gooch. He's been having some trouble with his shoulder, and um, he doesn't say anything about it. He'll say, I'm fine. Then you have to look at Sister Gooch and get the good, clear report. But uh, we're going to ask him if he would. Brother Gooch, would you stand and remember these requests for us, please, and pray for us. Bray. Not only she's a very brave girl, a little shy about being in front of people, but the water is very cold this morning, and I appreciate her. Ashley, I love you. I'm glad you got saved. I appreciate your family. I'm glad to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You're married with Christ in baptism. Give you a walk and you survive. Excellent job. God bless your heart. Look at that girl out for lunch. 